Hello, this is Ryan Ray of AAII. We are talking about the latest and greatest from the world of finance and investing for the individual investor. We're broadcasting, and if you're watching this in the archive, we do post our upcoming live show schedule on AAII.com slash webinars, and AAII members do have access to the full archive of shows. My guests today are Paul Merriman, John Bykowski, and Brian Portnoy. Today's show has three topics. In the first segment of this episode of the Individual Investor Show, we talk with Paul Merriman about new angles for viewing performance that you may not have considered. Next, we look at socially responsible mutual funds and exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, that pass our first cut list for best one-year return. Finally, Brian Portnoy joins us to pull back the curtain on how some financial advisors, portfolio managers, and other financial experts invest their own money and the lessons you can take from their personal money stories. Plus, our listener mailbag section where we answer your questions. Let's get started. Performance is something that many investors seek, sometimes at their pleasure and sometimes at their own peril. My next guest wrote a recent article talking about some of the aspects of performance some investors may miss. AAII Journal contributing editor Paul Merriman is president of the Merriman Financial Education Foundation and co-author with Richard Buck of the new book, We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. Welcome, Paul. Ryan, it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, so let's get right into it, Paul. What is everyone missing about performance? This is a bit of a leading question, of course, because I, but I suspect there's more to portfolio returns than just the numbers. Well, there's a lot that people don't consider. I, I think they know many of these things, but they don't give a lot of thought to it. For, for example, when I wrote that book about the 12 uh, simple ways to supercharge your portfolio, your retirement, I was looking for a half a percent from each of those 12 things. And the reason I was looking for a half a percent is because a half a percent over a lifetime of investing will, will produce probably anywhere from one to three to $5 million, depending on how much money you invest, obviously. But it doesn't take much for that half a percent to add up over a lifetime. And so I really want people to be aware wherever they can find that extra half a percent. Be, for example, they don't tell you when they when you buy a CD, the bank doesn't tell you what the after-tax return is. Well, of course, they can say, I don't know your personal taxes, but the reality is they don't want people to think of an even lower number than it already is. So the same is true with mutual funds, for example. Most people do not go to Morningstar and look at the tax impact of owning an actively managed fund versus an index fund. And if we're looking for a half a percent, I think it's pretty important to realize that the average actively managed fund has about a percent and a half in reduction of, of returns. Of course, that's based on the highest tax rates, but it reduces it by a percent and a half compared to a half a percent with the average index fund. So, you know, those, those are huge differences. Those are life changers. And so they, they're not easy to dig out for some people who are in a hurry. You know, uh, you know one thing a skeptic might say looking at performance purely is, is trusting the figures themselves. Is there something innate in looking at performance returns that may mislead investors trying to read the tea leaves, so to speak? Well, it, it really depends on what the focus is, what, what moves the investor to actually do something with their money, whether it's to buy more or sell or hold, whatever it might be. But people put a lot of faith in recent performance. And that is time and time again, gotten investors in trouble because not only do they make the mistake of looking at recent performance, I'm thinking, for example, back from 95 to 99, where the S&P 500 compounded at 20 half and 28 and a half percent. Well, that was, that was actually pretty exciting, particularly if it could continue to do that. Unfortunately, for the next decade, while investors believed the returns were gonna be 20 to 30%, it was actually uh, what they call the lost decade where the S&P 500 lost 
about 1% a year. Maybe not catastrophic, but that's a far cry from making 20 to 30% a year. And along with that, people often get enamored with recent returns, ignoring the volatility that comes along with those returns. One of the famous stories was from, I think it was from 10 years ending about 1998, CGM Focus, hot, really a hot performer. It earned about an 18, 17 to 18% a year compound rate of return. Uh, maybe the best performer, but one of the best, certainly. They actually tracked the cash in and the cash out of that fund. What did the investors get? Well, the investors actually got about a negative 16% a year return. How can that be? Well, it can be because people get uh, sucked in to high performance, forgetting about with high performance comes high downside and more than people are willing to take. So when they make the decision, I want to buy something, it typically is because they've got in their mind, they got making money, making money. Well, they got to stop for a second and say, what about losing money, losing money? And that's what I try to get people to do is to be thoughtful about the upside, the downside. And remember, like it or not, that luck is going to be a major impact on how you do as an investor. Uh, you know, one of, when we talk about uh, volatility, one of the antidotes to that is consistency. And I wanted to ask you in relation to performance uh, about consistency of investing in taxes, or as many of our view viewers may understand this, dollar cost averaging in taxes. Um, how does performance relate to these two aspects of investing? Well, the taxes, uh, as I mentioned before, that's that could have an impact of anywhere from a half to even 2% a year if you had real high turnover uh, in a mutual fund. And then, by the way, as I think your folks know, uh, you can have a year where you don't make much money in a mutual fund, but because it had some realized gains during that year, there you are paying taxes on money you didn't even earn. So, so the, of course, this is one of the beauties of the index fund uh, is that uh, the taxes are not only lower because of a less turnover, but you, you generally do not have that possibility of a huge capital gains uh, uh, surprise. Now, the dollar cost averaging is an interesting topic because I really think that dollar cost averaging is one of the smartest things a young investor can do where they put money into a 401k or an IRA because the beauty of dollar cost averaging is it guarantees that if the market goes down, you get more shares. It also guarantees when the market is high, you're going to buy fewer shares. Well, what we love for a first time investor is if their dollar cost averaging into the market and getting all these done. Now, you, you got to make, make sure you realize I'm not talking about Enron here or Eastern Airlines or Washington Mutual. I'm talking about diversified portfolios where the likelihood of going out of business is almost zero, but that you get low prices, which later you will hopefully benefit from. That's the good news. The bad news is people do dollar cost average, averaging at the other end of their life, and that's when they're taking money out. And the very thing that is wonderful for the first time investor is terrible for somebody who's newly retired and you're taking money out at the same time as the market is going down. And it is interesting to note uh, and, and as you know, Ryan, asset allocation is probably the most important decision that we make. And part of that is how much in equities and how much in bonds. You put some bonds in that portfolio when you're retired and the market goes down. It doesn't save you from all the risk of a declining market, but it can soften the blow enough that there'll be enough money there when the market turns and goes back up that, uh, that, that you'll actually be able to benefit from that. But if you have your money all in equities, 
you have this possibility of running out of money before you run out of life. And that's when you get to know your children better. <laughs> Uh, well, well, Paul, since I have you here and you've dropped a, a bunch of, of nuggets of wisdom here, I, I'd be remiss not to ask for your for your guidance. What is the best um, takeaway or perspective that you can offer, given all the caveats you just laid out about performance? Well, I, I think the most important guidance, uh, and it really is about you. If you don't know you and what you need in terms of return or uh, how much risk you can take, you're likely to make some decisions that are not going to be in your best interest. That's, that's one of the reasons I produce tables, massive tables of numbers that show annual returns, the good times and the bad, and, and what, is, what happens if you add some fixed income? Now, how much does it shelter you from the, de the major declines? Get some real sense of what the, the risk is, and by the way, when you see the return on those kind of tables, I'd take 2% off the top and just assume instead of getting 10% a year or 9% a year, you're going to get 8% a year or 6% a year. But to be very careful that you are investing with your personal needs. Now, there's also desire. And that makes it a little more difficult. I'm a teacher. I don't manage money for people. I show them, teach them how to do it. But it is a problem as a teacher to look into your heart, because that's where desire comes from, or your brain that, that is about emotions, and to be able to help guide you. So that's where a lot of people, if they really want to spend a few bucks, get an advisor to look at what you're doing. You don't have to hire them for a lifetime. Hire them for a few minutes or a few hours just to, to check to make sure the decisions you're making are taking all of these aspects of performance into consideration. Well, careful and cautious. That's what a great note to end on. Paul, thank you so much for the interview. Um, I just want to ask you before we, we leave, uh, where can people find you and your work? paulmerriman.com. That's our website, 700 articles and podcasts, article, I mean, the recommendations at Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, Fidelity, Schwab, all there to try to help make investing more profitable for you. Great. Well, if uh, viewers would like to learn more about this topic, you please look for Paul's article in the April 2021 AII Journal. It's simply titled, There is More to Portfolio Returns Than Just the Numbers. And that's available both in the print edition and on AII.com. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you, Ryan. Enjoyed it. Segment, we're calling in pinch header John Bykowski to comment and answer questions on two of our April first cut lists, wherein uh, Charles Ropla took a look at socially responsible mutual funds and ETFs. For those of you who are unaware, Charles had an accident not too long ago and is on the injured reserve list to further extend our baseball metaphor. Anyways, uh, welcome, John. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's get into the socially responsible mutual funds first cut list itself. Uh, as Charles noted, uh, socially responsible funds attempt to match investors' investments with their beliefs, something in the financial industry, uh, how they talk about it as companies that have favorable environmental, social, and governance ratings, or ESG for short. Um, but that's not exclusively what this first cut list is about. What factors led to these ESG-oriented mutual funds to make the list? Well, when it came to the mutual funds, uh, Charles was looking at not only funds that are designated as having an ESG-type rating, but also he tried to exclude those that had the, the highest expense ratios and those who had the worst performance relative to other peers in their same category. And what came out was a mix of funds. Uh, uh, yeah, like I just mentioned, the, the funds on this list represent a mix of categories, but interestingly, the returns also varied. Um, is there something that investors can read into here with only 26, uh, 26 ESG funds having at least one year of return data and only some of them outperforming their category peers? Well, there's there's two points here, and and while the first point is that while ESG in one form or another, you know, 20 years ago they were called socially conscious funds, uh, have been around for some time. I mean, in some cases they were uh, geared towards religious beliefs. In some cases, um, they were geared towards avoiding certain uh, in industries that are considered harmful, perhaps defense industries or, or sin sin industries. So. 
funds that are have some sort of social overlay to their investing process have been around for some time. But really, I would say in the last you know, three, four years, uh, there's been much more determined uh, desire by investors to really try to uh, make sure that the companies they're investing in, the funds they're investing in, kind of tie up with some of their personal beliefs. And while there was one blanket uh, socially conscious label that appeared years ago, now typically there's three designations used, as you mentioned, environmental, uh, companies that have some sort of environmental concern as far as they're investing, socially conscious, where they're actually taking a look at some, some perhaps good of, of society, and governance, how are they actually themselves managed as, as organizations. And so the whole world right now is taking a look at that process. And Europe is a, perhaps a bit, bit ahead of that. But in some cases, companies themselves are reporting their ESG uh, impact on the, on the world. And in this case, also now you have mutual funds or ETFs that invest in these companies also following policies. So what we're seeing is just a tremendous growth or interest in companies that have and funds that invest in companies that have some sort of filter to exclude what they consider the worst companies in that area. So that's probably why we've had a growth and that's why only, you know, some of these companies and, and funds are so new that they don't have a full long history of, of operating. Uh, so that's why that, that occurred. But in terms of the variance of returns, because it's important in that context is that, you know, no matter what, um, the, the socially conscious the ESG uh, is, is kind of an overlay to the investment philosophy of the funds themselves. So in, in a ESG stock that is investing in international holdings um, versus a large cap domestic ESG fund will have a, a potentially a very different rate of return. And as is the case in when it comes to picking funds or, or even stocks is you wanna first figure out what kind of asset allocation you want to have. And then you could use the ESG filter to find out well, what are the best large cap stocks or large cap uh, funds that you know exclude what I, companies that I don't really want to invest in. So that's why you have such a variance in return. So when looking at the list of, of, of passing funds or ETFs that are in our, our article here, and again, if you're a A plus investor, you can go online and, and run this predefined filter yourself. I always like to kind of rank them or, or base them on the category first. And th within the category, see which of these ESG uh, funds have good performance relative to other ESG funds in that category, whether their expenses are low and how their volatility is. Um, I want to turn to the socially responsible ETF first cut list, uh, which is the second list that Charles put together. Uh, this operates under the similar principles, of course, of the fund first cut list. Um, Charles wrote here that, quote, investors have not needed to sacrifice doing well to do good, end quote, when it comes to this list. Um, what did he mean by that exactly? Well, there isn't really, you're not necessarily giving up much return uh, when it comes to having this additional filter of requiring that a, a fund be socially conscious or invest in socially conscious companies. So you're not necessarily, it hasn't been that much of a re negative return implication for investing in, in companies that do follow the principles of ESG. Uh, on both lists, we've uh, we've included A plus investor grades, which, uh, as you, as you mentioned, they work in principle similar to grades in school. Um, you know, A being highly ranked, F being lower ranked. Um, considering the ESG theme of these lists, I'm surprised that not all of these funds and ETFs have A's across the board. Could you give our uh, our viewers uh, a little bit of color on the A plus investor grades versus maybe the subjective lens some may view these particular securities through? Sure. Well, the the A plus investor mutual fund grades. Are, are, are an attempt to basically examine how a, a fund fares uh, and compares against funds that are in the same investing category or, or same specific mutual fund category. So we're looking at, and it comes to performance, we're looking at how the funds rank against all large cap growth funds, for example, or all small cap value funds. So. What you're going to find is that certain sectors, certain industries, certain investing styles will move in and out of fashion at points in time. And if you were to simply look at funds that had high absolute returns without regard to how that category itself performed, you may be just simply chasing last year's winners. So to use grades such as these, it's important to see, you know, typically speaking, how are large companies doing, how are small companies doing, how are international companies doing, or if you're looking in a sector area, how are other 
protect technology sector funds investing? How are they performing? And how does this particular fund and fund manager compare against its peers? So now you could identify whether or not this fund is doing well in its style. If it's actually making, giving you a, a competitive advantage as far as how it's investing, or if it's consistently underperforming other funds of the same investment characteristic, perhaps it's a fund to avoid. The other kinds of grades that are in there that deal not only with performance, but deal also with risk. So one way to achieve potentially higher long-term uh, performance is to actually take on more risk. Well, in this case, a grade of A will be those funds that are less volatile than other funds in the same category. The grade of an F are funds that are more volatile than funds in the same category. And that same applies for expenses. So a, a category grade of A means that this particular fund is much lower, has a much lower expense ratio than other funds in that same grouping. Uh, as a reminder to our viewers, the, the first cut list is a jumping off point for investing ideas. But if you're someone interested in investing in ESG-oriented assets, uh, whether they be mutual funds or ETFs, or as you said earlier, you know perhaps a stock or a company, um, are there other considerations uh, that you haven't discussed uh, that people should be aware of? Well, I, I, again, uh, I, no matter what, when it comes to investing, I think it starts off with your philosophy, your time horizon. So if you're going to be investing in stocks, you know, understand this is money that you may not want to be able to touch for five to eight years before you could actually be certain that the potential greater rate of return these will offer will, 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 will be there. And in that context, that's really why the uh, individual investors wealth building process, the, the learn and plan thing we have on our website helps take you through the different stages of that. Uh, well, thank you for your time, uh, John, to speak on this. If you'd like to learn more about the socially responsible funds and ETFs for cut lists, I would recommend uh, checking out Charles's pair of articles in the April 2021 AI journal uh, titled Socially Responsible Mutual Funds and then Socially Responsible ETFs. That's available both in the print edition and on AI.com. Thanks, John. Pleasure. The personal money stories of advisors, portfolio managers, and other financial experts can help you navigate your own financial journey. This is the thesis statement of my next guest's recent AAII journal article, as well as his new book, How I Invest My Money, Finance Experts Reveal How They Save, Spend, and Invest. Brian Portnoy, who's a doctor and CFA, is the founder of Shaping Wealth, an educational technology firm that promotes financial well-being, and he co-wrote his latest book with wealth manager Joshua Brown. Welcome, Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, I wanted to start off uh, this interview with how you came to this book and project. I think a lot of our viewers and investors generally seek out the greatest investors to try to find the, quote, right way to invest. Is there a right way? And is there someone out there investors should be idolizing? Uh, there is not a, a, a right way. Um, I mean, prior to writing this book and going back nearly 20 years, uh, I've spent most of my time in the investment business, um, not really the case right now uh, with my current venture, but many years in evaluating money managers, allocating other people's money, building portfolios, you know, uh, picking investments. And you know, one thing I noted in meeting literally thousands of fund managers over the years is that there, there's not ever one right way to do things. There, there tends to be one right way for someone specifically, and, and it's in their interest to kind of figure out what that rhythm is. Just keep in mind, you know, some people are drawn to value investing. Some people are drawn to momentum investing. There are virtues and liabilities of both approaches, but, you know, some people gravitate toward one, one style for, uh, versus the other. What we saw in this case, um, in the 25 contributions to the book, was a continuation of that same idea, which is that you've got a lot of people who know a lot about finance and investing, but um, at some level, they all went about doing things in their own way. Uh, your article gets into the difference between what is prophesized by some of these advisors and portfolio managers, and then you know to contrast how they actually lead their own lives. Um, are there some commonalities or maxims that financial experts share? At some level, yes. I mean, this book of 25 quote unquote experts, it's, it's mostly financial advisors, but there are some portfolio managers and some venture capitalists. You know, there are some basic maxims that I think all of us would generally agree to, like invest for the long run, 
buy low, sell high, you know, try not to spend too much, say, you know, save more than you spend, so on and so forth, those sorts of rules. I, 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 I think those maxims are shared. I don't know that that's actually a particularly interesting point, but I think some of those basic rules of the road are widely agreed to, as opposed to, you know, sort of li living fast, living beyond your means, spending a lot, investing as speculating and gambling, you know, things that uh, a, a, a lot of people do. The, the interesting part, Ryan, is that when you take those basic maxims of investing for the long run and say, save more, spend less, but then you put them into somebody's particular life circumstances, you, you then have a really interesting cocktail where everybody's decisions end up being a little bit different. Do you wanna pay off your mortgage early, not just for financial reasons, but for psychological reasons? Should you, should you buy a vacation home? How do you wanna save for your kid's college or should they pay, it for, uh, pay for college themselves? And there are certain value uh, uh, judgments that work into that. So you move across all these different decisions uh, in, in our money lives. And just because you share the same principles doesn't mean that you're gonna end up making the same actual real world decisions. Uh, since you brought up value sets, you know, something I was struck by in your article was the comment of investing in oneself and according to one's values. Um, you know, relatedly, one thing, you know, our organization, AAII Champions, is keeping your investing goals in mind. Um, did you find that many of the financial experts you spoke to consist consistently did keep to their value set or goals? Well, one thing I do here is make a pretty strong distinction between values and goals. Th th those are different things, and, and I'd want you know, the audience or your listeners to, to, to maybe, maybe uh, appreciate the, the distinction that, that I have in mind. When I think about goals, those are pretty straightforward things like I want to retire at a particular age with a particular amount of money that's going to produce a particular amount of cash flow, or I want to travel or a vacation home, or I'm going to help a sick relative. Like those are all goals in the sense that you know, it's something specific. They're 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 sort of a, a target date of sorts, uh, and and you're trying to save or invest to achieve a certain amount of money. So those those are our goals. Super important, and it's almost table stakes. Not that everyone does it, but it's table stakes that we should think pretty closely or carefully, I should say, through the goals that define our financial lives. Different than values. So take retirement for example. Um, you know, so this is a made up thing, right? Like starting 150 plus years ago, Western society, Europe, and then eventually US um, had something called ret retirement, um, where, you know, um, it was legitimated and sponsored in part by the government and corporations. And so it became a thing. I mean, for most of humanity's entire history, there wasn't retirement. You kind of work till you died or work till you couldn't work anymore and other people would, would take care of you. What it means to retire um, is something different to, to, to everybody. So some people truly want to stop working because they, they don't like working or they don't like their particular vocation and, and, and so they just want to stop. Others um, you know, want to focus on a different sort of career or other sorts of priorities. And one of the challenges with retirement is that, you know, you get to age 60 or 65 or, or, or whatever it is, and you stop doing something that's been very valuable and important to you over a long period, long period of time, in addition to, you know, generating money or, or, or cash flow. So, you know, what your values are is another distinct exercise in terms of who you are, who's important in your life, what are the causes that are important, what are the principles and characteristics of people that you know, stand out for you. Mapping up those values and your goals, that's hard work, but it's really important work. And you know, the chapters in the book kind of spoke to you know, very individual stories um, uh, along those lines. 
Um, I wanted to touch a little bit about the anxiety that uh, was experienced by some investors and financial experts alike in discussing uh, money and, uh, and with uh, financial literacy at, on a, as a whole. Uh, do you think that these can be uh, you know, hurdles to managing money? Is there a lesson for investors here in navigating this discomfort or you know, uncomfortable conversations about this? 100%. You know, money is an anxiety written um, topic. Uh, even with these quote unquote experts, I had plenty of offline conversations with some of them where, you know, they're managing a lot of other people's money, but no one's really ever asking how they manage their money. And as they began to think about their story and how they grew up and what's important to them, again, thinking about values and identity as distinct from specific financial planning goals, uh, it's a little bit nerve wracking. Um, there's plenty of studies that show American Psychological Association has some that, you know, of all the big topics in life, um, money, politics, death, religion, money's the number one stressor. Um, don't have time today to get into a deep dive as to why, but it's an incredibly stressful topic and, and not because it's a complicated math problem, but because it's an emotional lightning rod that it triggers issues of greed and fear and joy and envy and hope. And as we not only plan big picture for our money life, but we live day to day in executing um, all of the saving and spending and investing and borrowing that we do, um, it's super anxiety ridden. And one reason that financial literacy is such a seemingly insurmountable mountain um, in, in our society is that um, it's even hard to breach the topic. It's hard to like even get into it. Uh, so hopefully this book and, and other projects like it will you know, reveal to regular folks that even the experts struggle with figuring out what's important and how to afford things. At the top, I, I mentioned your book. Uh, before we go, I, where can people follow you and your work, Brian? This is your chance to, to plug what you're working on. <laughs> yeah, so I am CEO and founder of Shaping Wealth. We're an educational technology company focused on financial well-being, and um, we create uh, content and, and training and other experiences for audiences all, all over the world, individual investors, corporations, financial advisors, shapingwealth.com is the website uh, and I'm pretty active on financial Twitter where there's tons of great dialogue about what you and I are talking about right now. And my handle on Twitter is just my name. It's at Brian Portnoy. Great. Well, uh, thanks Brian for that. Uh, if you'd like to mo learn more about this topic, uh, first of all, I'd recommend checking out Brian's book. Uh, secondly, I'd, I'd recommend checking out uh, Brian's article in the April 2021 AI journal. It's simply titled uh, Lessons from How Professionals Invest Their Money. It's available both in the print edition and on AAII.com. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you. All right. And now for our listener mailbag segment, where we address questions that have been submitted by viewers and AI members and answer them here. If you have a question for us, you can submit it using the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel, or you can email me, which is rreeh at aaii.com with the subject line, II show question. All right, John, we had one question this week, and I wanted to have you answer it. This one comes in from Don Eck. He asks, what direction or guidance does AAII offer to those interested in having a financial planner and considering mutual funds? Are there any general tips? Oh, it's, it's, it's a great question, and it, it points to the, 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 the wide array of members that we attract. I mean, many, some of our members want to do a direct um, management of their assets. Others want to help advisor to help them in the process. And it's actually one of the things that we do cover in our uh, wealth building process. And uh, Charles Rothblood did an article on that very uh, subject matter back in the October 2020 uh, edition of the AI Journal called Determining Your Portfolio Management Preferences. And then he kind of talks about the, the different arrays that you can do, uh, whether or not you want to manage things yourself or if you want to hand part of that off to a manager. And one other our, our guidance, if you want to do some research on this, is you may need a different kind of financial professional for retirement by Julie Jason. And that was in the January 2020 uh, issue of the journal. And both of those articles are available online. And in fact, uh, the wealth building process is available online as part of a learn and plan 
step. Where it's kind of a, a five stages of investing, and it points to the need of, of coming up with a overall uh, philosophy investing, taking a look at your long-term needs, your asset allocation, and determining how you want to pick the assets in that determine in that particular plan. And that's where I guess this question comes about, because really. Charles covers it and Julie covers it. There's really an important consideration when it comes to hiring any kind of, of, of financial professional to help you. There's different classes of, of financial professionals and how are they compensated is a very important question. I, I personally, if I'm gonna be hiring someone to help me with my financial planning, I prefer to work with a fee only planner. And what a fee only planner does is they, they don't get any commissions for recommending any specific investments to you. So when it comes to hiring any kind of planner, first ask, how are they being compensated? And you may want to consider, you know, if they're getting, if you're not paying them directly to put together a plan together and help you pick uh, particular strategies, chances are they're getting compensated by the, the products they're recommending to you. So you also want to ask if they're a fiduciary. And a fiduciary has a special relationship with you. You have to put your best interests, they have to do everything they do is in your best interest for how they're doing it. Many people call themselves planners or helpers in this area, and they may or may not be a fiduciary in that context. So those are things you could take a look at in those articles. Look at qualifications as well. Uh, there are people that go through a certification process, certified financial planners. They actually go through a, a field of study that looks at things such as taxes, financial planning, insurance, and they keep up to date on those elements. So those are all types of considerations you, you want to take in place when it comes to picking someone to help you pick some stocks to manage your investment portfolio, and also take a look at your long-term financial plan. And also you can do an, a, a search on the SEC website. If someone is a registered investment advisor, they will be uh, registered on the SEC site. Any kind of complaints, information that's about them will be available there. So a lot of great resources are available in that area. And again, start off with AI Journal and those few articles I mentioned and any other questions come up, you know, I'm sure they'll give you an email, Ryan, and we'll cover it up in an, an, another edition of the Individual Investor Show. All right, well, great. Uh, thank you for, for pointing to all those things, John. And uh, <laughs> Thanks to Don for that for that question. Again, if you have a, a question for us, you can submit it using the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel. Or again, uh, as John mentioned, you can email me. Uh, it's in the thing, Chiron and below, R-R-E-E-H at A-A-I-I.com with the subject line, I-I show question. We will get them on air for the next individual investor show. Thanks, John. A pleasure. If you liked our show, please visit A-A-I-I.com slash webinars to register for more webinar and video content. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at AAII underscore invest underscore ED. For more investing education, I invite you to check out our website, AAII.com. Again, I want to thank our guests, Paul Merriman, John Bykowski, and Brian Portnoy. And you for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.